Good morning, everyone. You're very welcome today, and um, thank you for coming out. Thank you for being here. And if you're watching online, you're very welcome as well <coughs> to our, our service here in Newcastle Baptist Church. I just want to read some lovely verses uh, from Psalm 107, right? Uh, from a couple of verses at the start and a couple of verses at the end. In between, there, there's a list that the, the writer gives. And it's, God has rescued me from this. God has rescued me from this. God has rescued me from this. And it's all about thanking the Lord for his rescuing, for his care, for his watching over. Psalm 107. And we're just going to read the first three verses. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. And then God's rescue, God's rescue, God's rescue. And right at the end then, verses 41 to 43. But he raises up the needy out of affliction and makes their families like flocks. The upright see it and are glad, and all wickedness shuts its mouth. Whoever is wise, let him attend to these things. Let them consider the steadfast love of the Lord. Let's pray together as we uh, join for worship today. Lord, we thank you and we give you thanks as we have been called to do through your word. And one of the things that stands out in this lovely psalm that we read, or part of it, is that you are a God whose love is steadfast. It never changes because you do not change. You're the same God yesterday, today, and forever. You will always be the same. And, oh God, you've given to your people the greatest love of all. While we were still sinners, while we were rebels, while we were at war with the Lord, Christ died for us. Lord, this has inspired many songs over the years. Such love that you have given to your people. We thank you, O God, that if we had taken time to read the rest of this psalm, we would see your rescue. You're stepping into the lives of people at once to bring them to know you, but often in circumstances beyond their control you have rescued. And Lord, we thank you that today your people can still run to you. We find in you, and you have given us the words, a refuge. We find in you our strength. We find in you our hope. We find in you our joy. We find in you our peace. We find in you our comfort. We find in you everything that we need. Lord, we ask your blessing upon us this day. We pray for this church, for all who are here, all who are watching at home or will watch later, for young, for old. And we thank you for the ever and always new Word of God. And we pray that that Word will refresh us, challenge us, inspire us, give us hope, call us back, whatever it needs that will touch our lives this day. Lord, we want to remember the locality here in our own area. Been through quite a difficult few days and still going on. We want to thank you for your professionals who have come in in teams to help us. And we pray your continued protection upon them. Some of us, many of them, will be known to us. And we commend them to you. Lord, looking further afield, we pray for families in India at the moment, going through difficult times. We pray for the families of those Indonesian submariners, what they must be thinking. Oh God, in their religions, may they turn to you. And if any of those families know you, may you richly strengthen them, help them, and even work through them to help others in these days. We pray for 
our own area, also in the opening and reopening of schools and shops. And we thank you for care homes and those who are caring after others from their own homes and into their own homes. Lord, may your blessing be upon us all. And as things open up further, may we continually seek after you. And may you guide and direct us, even here as a church, and for other places of worship as well, that we will take the right moves and make the right choices. We pray for our association of churches in Ireland, and we pray for those guiding and helping in a very uh, direct and administrative way, helping. We pray for Trevor Ramsey, Joe Flanagan. We pray for Dave Ramsey. We pray for Matt Campbell, for Gail Curry, for Edwin Yurt, Davy Ellison, and others who are connected on various committees, Mervyn Scott and Mission. Lord, we all need you, and we need you. We pray, O oh Lord, for Mabel Smith, just not too well at the moment. And we pray, Lord, too, for Moira's brother, Bob, and commit him to you. And others, O oh God, and we'll hear in a moment or two a lovely thought or two about little Harry, and we commend him to you and his family as well. Lord, for our mission family, we pray also for Stuart and Dave and Alan, for the work of CAP. But God, we need you in these days. Lord, you know how we have come here. You know our thoughts. You know our week. You know how we have continued to, to live out at times our old nature. We have sinned. We ask your forgiveness. But we come right back to where we started, to that steadfast love of God and your rescue, O oh Lord. Father, as we consider the subject again this morning of fear, that you will help us to find grace and help in the one who is described by you in your word as the Prince of Peace. And in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray these things. Amen. I said you're all very welcome. Just a, a few announcements. Tonight, one of our interviews goes out at 7 o'clock on the YouTube. And tonight it will be an interview uh, that Bertie has had with Matt Tuttleby. Matt Tuttleby, some of you will know that name, others will know him personally. Uh, Matt and his family uh, live close to Bondoran, and Matt is a church planter in Bondoran, the West. He's got a tremendous way of doing things, and God has richly blessed his mini ministry in other parts. So that's our short 20-minute interview tonight at 7 p.m. Wednesday night, prayer focus at half seven, and Friday morning's mission prayer focus is not on uh, this week. And Friday evening, or sorry, Wednesday evening, by the way, is by, by Zoom. Hopefully we can start to, to change things a little. Uh, Thursday night, we have a men's night organized by the association. The title is Step Up and Lead. And it's calling men, particularly younger men, to step up uh, to the plate of ministry, to the plate of leadership uh, in local churches, uh, and not just drift through life. If anybody would like to go to that, I can give you the details uh, of that on Thursday uh, evening. Uh, as we slowly come out of lockdown, we know you've been praying for that and, and you've, you've done that well. And we want to continue to pray for that. We're taking little steps. And a couple of those steps are a bit like this. On the 9th and the 23rd of May, we're going to have a shine program taking place in the hall. So two Sundays in May, at the same time the church will be going on. If you're not sure what Shine is, by the way, that's our Sunday school, in effect. But we call it Shine, and that will take place out there. And then on the Sunday night in between the 16th, we'll also go into the hall. We're not quite sure what we do. We have a couple of ideas we're playing with, and just pray about that as well as we start to ease ourselves out of uh, lockdown. Uh, I'm on leave from Friday until the following Wednesday. Uh, if anybody needs help, um, contact Bertie, and he'll guide you, or Billy will be available as well. And Billy's speaking next Sunday morning, and I'm delighted about that. And thank you, Billy, for doing that for us. Our theme is, is getting away from fear. Uh, and we see that that is something that 
could battle or be in a battle with us all of our lives, but there are victories, and there is one who is great, and we need to come to him. And we come to him, and we worship him, and we seek his face. And we're going to sing uh, just now. I'm going to just say, just on the basis of the numbers we have this morning, let's just keep our seats. You can sing, but softly uh, and behind the mask. And it's a lovely song, Hide Me Now. And after that, Bertie will come and speak to the boys and girls. Now, just uh, a message from uh, Catherine Hazard here, uh, just about Harry, just to read to you this morning, uh, just as an update on Harry. He got his stitches taken out successfully yesterday. There were some signs of infection in the middle of the week, but these have thankfully now subsided and the punctures are closed and healing. Swelling is gone almost entirely. The nurse who took his stitches out yesterday was the same lady who put them in the previous week. And she said she was so pleased at how his cheek looked as she honestly thought we would have been back with a severe infection. Thankfully now, given how well he has healed the past couple of days, he shouldn't scar badly. Thank you for all your thoughts and prayers and for the texts and calls, Catherine Hazard. There's an update for you. Let's pray together just about Harry and commend that situation to the Lord. Our Heavenly Father, we want to say thank you for your help for Catherine and Nigel and for Harry over this past week. We thank you for the improvement that there has been. And we would want to continue to pray for Harry and to ask for your continued help for him and continued healing for him as well. And so we commend him and Catherine and Nigel to you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well now, boys and girls, it's good to see you this morning, and this morning we're going to think about a verse of Scripture. Um, it comes from the book of Isaiah. I'm going to have it on the screen. There it is. It's uh, a verse that many of you uh, will know well. It says, the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the words of our God stands forever. But the word of our God stands forever. Let me read it again just to get it into our minds. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the words of our God stands forever. Uh, I brought a few things just to show you this morning. Um, this is something that the farmers are looking for these days. Talking to Bertie coming in, and you maybe have some grass like that in your garden. That was cut a few days ago, and you can see what's happened to it. It's now withered a bit and it wasn't quite as it was. Here's what it was it looked like a few days ago. A bit different, that would do your cows all right, Bertie, or whatever you have in your, your farm. 
farmers would be very glad for a whole lot more of that these days. But that's what happens to grass, isn't it? Uh, it's like that, and then you, you cut it, and it becomes like the other one, like this. It withers away. And when uh, Isaiah was writing these words, he wanted to remind the people that life was short and that things change. The grass changes from that to this, something that changes. And then here's something else that is from our garden. Maybe you have some of these in your garden. I'm sure you have. Daffy down dillies. Where did that word ever come from? Daffodils. Uh, and we have some that was picked this morning. I'm going to say plucked this morning. It was that as well. Uh, picked this morning, and there's a, a lovely daffodil. They're lovely flowers, aren't they? But we have some other daffodils in our garden at the minute, and here's what they look like. You maybe have some like those like that in your garden as well, withered and faded. And that's what happens, isn't it, with daffodils? Uh, they, they change from that to that. And again, it was a reminder to the people that life is short and things change. But in this verse, there is something that doesn't change. Two things that do change. The grass, it withers, and the flowers fade. But what doesn't change? It's the Word of God that doesn't change. The words of our God the Word of our God stands forever. And this book that I have in front of me, the truth of that doesn't change. This book tells me that I do things wrong, that I say things wrong, and I think things wrong, and I do things wrong. It's true of all of us, isn't it? And it tells us that those things separate us from God. God cannot be our friend, and one day we cannot go to be with Him in heaven. That's what the book says. That truth does not change. The Word of God stands forever. But this book tells me about somebody who came, the Lord Jesus, who came from heaven and came to this world and died on a cross so that those wrong things could be forgiven. And he showed his tremendous love for you and me when he gave his life, paying the price for our sin so that our sins might be wiped away, washed away, and we might be made clean. That's what the... The Bible says, that truth does not change. The Word of our God stands forever. And then this book speaks about a place called heaven, uh, a great place, a perfect place, where one day all who are trusting in Him, all who have been forgiven, will be there. That's what the, the Bible says. And that truth does not change. The Word of our God stands forever. And then this book tells me that through life, there is one who says, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. That's what God says in the book of Hebrews. I will never leave you. I will never, ever forsake you. That truth does not change. The word of our God stands forever. So this morning here are some things that do change. The grass withers and the flowers fall. One thing that doesn't change, the Word of our God stands forever. So this morning, when you think about grass, when you think about flowers, let your mind go to the thing that does not change, and let's value this book and value something that does not change because we have a God who does not change as well and is always the same, always faithful, always reliable, always dependable. He says he'll never leave us and he'll never forsake us. Thank you for listening today. Thank you, Bertie. I think you were battling with a Wessex that last part out there, outside. Let's um, turn to God's Word again. And we're going to read this time from 1 Samuel chapter 17. We were there last week, David and Goliath, familiar story to many people. We're not going to read the whole of the chapter. Um, 
Last week we looked at the very fact that there was a context of war, a context of fear. And in that context, we, we found that, that God was actually at work. And that took us on through a little further, especially when we found out that there, was, there were difficulties going on, that God's work was stalled or stalling or it appeared to be that way. But maybe it was just waiting. Maybe God was holding His time perfectly for someone to come. So we're going to read in uh, just from verse 12, then we'll skip a number of verses, and then we'll read to the end. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Now David was the son of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah. Verse 12. Named Jesse who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. And some of David's brothers, the three eldest, had gone off to fight. And Jesse sent David off with some cheese and other supplies to take to his brothers who were fighting or were there to fight uh, some distance uh, away. And verse 22 tells us that, And David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. As he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. And David heard him. And those words, by the way, were very simply, Send a man out, I'll fight him. Whoever wins, then the servants will be on the losing side, from the losing side to the victorious side. And he did this for six weeks or so. And we read there, the end of verse 23, and David heard him. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same way, so shall it be done to the man who kills him. And then he gets a bit of uh, negative feedback from uh, one of his uh, brothers. But on down in verse 31, we read these words. When the words that David spoke were heard and repeated them before Saul, he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you are not able to fight and, or to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he rose against me, I caught him by the beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them. For he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul clothed David with his armor, put a helmet of bronze on his head, and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor, and he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. Then David said to Saul, "I, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. Then he took a staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's pouch, a 
his sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with a shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the armies of heaven, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and Judah rose with a shout and pursued the Philistines as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron, so that the wounded Philistines fell on the way from Shararim as far as Gath and Ekron. And the people of Israel came back from chasing the Philistines, and they plundered their camp. David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. As soon as Saul saw David go out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, as your soul lives, O king, I, I do not know. And the king said, Inquire whose son this boy is. As soon as David returned from the striking down of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. And we know that God will bless his word to us. We're going to sing again a lovely song when peace like a river attends my way. An older song, but with a, it never goes out of date, does it? It's well with our soul because of who, whose side we are on. When peace like a river.
Thank you. Let's pray. Lord, we just ask that you'd help us to continue in your word, to understand it, and by your spirit, that you will apply truth to our minds and our lives, that we may walk with you even in a difficult and broken world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we said last week, that one of the greatest things that attacks God's people is, is fear. And I'm not going to go over a, a lot of the ground. I just want to recap very briefly. But, but fear actually is an industry, believe it or not. Or the, the attacking of fear is an industry. There are multi-million pound investments put into getting rid of, of fear. From fear of spiders, and I know some of you will identify with that, right through to the fear of, of dying itself, the fear of death. So it's something that's right there in the front of us, and something that's maybe come more to the fore in these COVID days, alongside everything else that we have in life as well. One of the most beautiful illustrations or pictures of fear and how to deal with it is found in 1 Samuel 17, because there you, you have fear. And last week we looked at fear is always set in a context. And the context set for here was the battle between the people of God and these group of other people who were constantly a thorn in the flesh called the Philistines, uh, and they were there as well. And so you have these two armies setting up, but they don't just rush into battle. They stand and face each other. And every day for six weeks, a nine and a half foot tall giant comes out, and he calls for one person from the Israelites to come out and, and fight against him. As soon as he appears, we're told, Everybody just takes a step back. And the reason is because they are afraid. And those words are there. In verse 11, when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, and they heard it every day, morning and evening, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. And we see the same again whenever he comes out. They stand back from these things. And that was the immediate context of fear upon God's people. And I'm sure there were people in the Philistine army who were afraid as well. They didn't want to fight. Their families didn't want them to come. But particularly think about the people whose God was the Lord and who trusted in Him, this fear. And the second thing we saw was that fear has a, has a stalling effect. It stops God's people doing what God's people were supposed to do. And it stops God's people doing what God's people are still supposed to do. It gets in our way. It gets in our life. It brings the future to the present. It brings the past sometimes to the present. And it causes a great battle. And it stops us moving forward in life. And gets in the way. It stops church being church and churches and mission societies doing what they do. And it stops individuals uh, stepping up to their calling, and whatever that is, God has for them, they, they stall because of fear. Fear of all sorts of things. It could be fear of family, fear of friends, fear of the future, fear of finance or the lack of it, fear of change. But let's go to number three, the third one. Fear has an unlikely enemy. Fear has an unlikely enemy. The enemies of the people of Israel in this context were the Philistines, the immediate people. And they were afraid of them. But David comes along and he's not afraid of them. And he's not afraid. And he's a most unlikely person. He's just gently introduced into 1 Samuel 17. I don't know if you've noticed that. Uh, it's just there. Now, David was the son of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem and Judah. He wasn't the age to go to war. He was younger. Later, he had a friend called Jonathan. And they weren't the same age. They couldn't have been because of the battles that they were doing. This man here was just looking after sheep. That's what he had done. But he had learned a lot while he was doing that. He had been in a place where God had taught him to overcome fear of lions and bears. And now he stands here, and all of a sudden, he's talking to people. And this guy, nine and a half feet tall, steps out. And I'm sure David went, whoa, that's a big person. But everybody else just stepped back 
and probably their faces change color again. David's different. He's not afraid. And he goes and asks a few questions about the person, what he's doing, and, and why he does this. And he learns very quickly that this man's coming out on his own, but he's defying the work and defying the person of the God of the armies of heaven, the living God, as David describes him. And so he works his way along the line. He asks the story, I think, a few times just to get the real picture of what's going on, and then word gets to Saul. There's a young guy here, and he says he's going to go out to fight him. So Saul interviews him very briefly for the job. He gets the job very quickly. He says, you'll need for this job to be attired in, in my armor. So let's get it on, and let's get out there, uh, and we'll see what you can do. And I'm sure Saul was saying, this guy has no hope. But nobody else is going to go. You know the story. Perhaps David tries on all the armor. It doesn't quite work. He says, I'm, that's not what I'm used to. And he goes to a little river, a little stream, and he picks up five stones, and he puts them in a little pouch, and he takes a sling. You know the rest. And he goes out in front. And he's ridiculed. He's a nobody. He's a dog chaser. As far as uh, the Philistine is concerned, Goliath. But he stands by this. You're coming to me in the name of your gods. I'm coming to you in the name of the living God whom you have defied. The one who holds all the armies of heaven. And you're fighting against him. The battle is his. It's not mine. The battle is the Lord's. And before Goliath is able to swallow all of that truth, He's hit in the forehead with a stone, and down he goes. Uh, and then a battle takes place. But it's a very unusual battle because one side is chasing and the other side is running. Very unlikely candidate, isn't he? When you think about it. Do you know that people think that way about Jesus? It's a, an illustration, isn't it, of a most unlikely rescuer, a most unlikely helper. Let me read to you some words, for example. In Isaiah 53, we read these words, written about 750 years before the Lord himself was born, but was always there because he is the eternal God. And Jesus, speaking of him when he came on the earth in human form, says, we esteemed him not. We estimated him as nothing, in other words. Just as these people had done with David, I'm sure that the people in his own army were feeling the same, and certainly Goliath on the other side. Who are you? That's an insult to bring this person out, to send this guy out with a stick and some wee bag he has and a piece of cloth or something wrapped around his arm. We esteemed him not, nothing. Isaiah 53 goes on to say, No form or majesty that we should look at him, despised, rejected, led like a lamb to be slaughtered. Does that look like a likely hero? Does that look like the Messiah who's coming to bring shalom, peace, holiness, perfection, righteousness, a new dawn, a new way of thinking, a new way of living. It doesn't seem so. And even when that Jesus was born and was growing up at the age of 30, went out on his first mission of gathering some people towards him, he directed his disciples to an area, and a man called Philip went to another friend of his called Nathaniel. Now, we know later that Nathaniel was a very good person. Someone you could trust, someone you would follow, someone you would heed. Here's how the conversation goes between Philip and Nathaniel about this person, this Jesus. We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And I suspect there was a pause at that point as, as Philip waited for a reaction.
reaction from Nathanael? What wisdom will he give? Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Can anything good come from Bethlehem to the battlefield? I hope you see the connection. Another one came from Bethlehem and went to live in Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Come and see. You know, those are probably for me some of the strongest words in that section. Come and see for yourself, Nathaniel. And Nathaniel is introduced to none other than the living God now on earth the one who is in control of the hosts of the armies of heaven, is standing in front of Nathaniel. And as the next three years progress, Nathaniel's mindset rapidly and rampantly changes as he says, yes, that's who that is. And with the others around him, they come to the conclusion that he can heal people, he can raise people from the dead, He can chase out demons. He can calm storms. He can do anything. Who is He? He is the living God in human form on the face of the earth. We're told in 1 John 3 and 9, John was there as well, by the way, writing sometime later, the person, or sorry, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. I guess there may be one or two here this morning, I don't know, or certainly watching online, and and you're intrigued by Jesus, by who He is, by what He did. And these stories that are taught and proclaimed by the Christian church, and sometimes part of the Christian church doesn't seem to even believe them. But we are putting forth someone who has radically changed our lives, who has come in the power of His Spirit to rescue us, an unlikely hero. We esteemed Him as nothing. We fought against Him. If we had been at the foot of the cross, we would have been laughing. If we had been there the day before or the night before, we would have shouted, crucify Him, because that's who we are. And yet, like the centurion at the foot of the cross, when He died, surely this was the Son of God. And that's exactly who he was, is, and ever will be. You know, when someone has a a fear problem, I wonder would they ever think of going to a Christian for help? Some do, actually, because they, they, they understand that there is a connection between a Christian and God. They mightn't quite understand how it came about. They mightn't quite understand what it means, but they know there's something. When a Christian is prepared to live his or her life out like Jesus, even though it's rubbish, and we we sit there, and they ask us a question, ask for help. And many of you perhaps have had that experience. You've been laughed at in the group, but on a one-to-one, someone has come to you and said, would you, would you pray for me? My marriage is breaking up. Would you pray for me? I have a real problem with gambling. Would you pray for me? There's someone in our family uh, and they're dying and I, I'm, I'm not going to cope with this. They, they see a connection with the unlikely enemy of fear that, that you and I know. And of course, we pray for them, to Jesus, the Son of the living God. He makes the difference. Uh, Fourthly, moving on quite quickly, fear has many endings, but one great ending. In the context of the story of David and Goliath, uh, they had a real reign of peace from the Philistines. But was David finished? No, he was only getting started, and so was fear. 
Unfortunately, David had an enemy, and that enemy was the one who actually gave him the go-ahead to go out to battle, Saul. Because Saul got very jealous when people started to sing and know about David. David has slain his tens of thousands. Saul has slain, well, about a thousand. Not quite that, but that was how Saul was thinking. And there were always endings. And he always had to return back to God. If you read through a lot of the Psalms, they are written by this guy, David. And as he writes, he calls out to God, and you can see fear. You can sense distress. You can sense things that are going on in, the, in his life and his family. And at one point, he did wander off big time. And the battles are still there. And God keeps coming back to help in the battle. God's like that. And fear works like that. So there are many endings, but there is one great ending. Uh, I want to point you to, if you've got a Bible with you, Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews written to encourage Jewish Christians to stick at their Christian faith and not go back to a, a very comfortable and colorful religion where there seems to be safety. The writer says, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Him. I'm going to read from verse 14 of Hebrews chapter 2. Since therefore children, the children, us in other words, share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death, his death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. And listen to these words, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. The greatest fear we have is the fear of dying. And Jesus came to eradicate that fear. And he did it by dying himself on the cross that we might now be in him and have the same strength and accuracy that David had in our battles because he is the living God. He is the commander of the armies of the glorious heavenly places. And he is greater than all. And he is the one who will close the battle totally. Revelation 20 to 22, read those chapters in your time. You will see the end of the battle. We're told the end of the battle before it's, it's over because God wins. In uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 8, we're told that the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. And verse 14 says, and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. And those lovely words, they're written as if the battle's finished already. So sure, so certain is the battle that Satan will be defeated who brings us the fear and keeps us captive to fear. It's written as if it's already happened. The darkness is passing away. The true light is already shining. Verse 14, and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Our time's gone and I just want to finish, but let me add a couple of things. Maybe you're tuning in and you're not a Christian, but you're interested enough to listen or watch or hear. Let me say that you will have many fears in your life, as Christians will have too, about certain things. But your greatest fear, and I say this very carefully, your greatest fear is yet to come. Because one day you will stand like Goliath before the commander of the armies of heaven, the living God. And you won't be able to say anything. You won't be able to shout like Goliath shouted. Just be there. And that has to be according to the vision of Scripture, the descriptions from Scripture, the worst, greatest fear that anyone could ever have. 
thank God for the gospel. Thank God for the cross. Thank God for Jesus, the unlikely person coming into the world because he went to the cross that you don't have to go through that route. You can walk with the Lord, even through the valley that will be dark, but it will be dark with Christ, the light. And many have experienced that over many years. But you'll only find it in that personal relationship with Jesus who died on the cross that you might be free, that you might find fear can actually be dispelled and peace, the shalom of God described by the Prince of Peace himself coming into your life. Think about that. The second thing is for those of us who are Christians. We are going to find fears popping up all the time. But there always will be a solution. Jesus said, peace I give to you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives. And the peace of God is something very, very different. And it's the opposite of fear. So when fear comes, peace can also be there almost at the same time. But we're told that uh, by John, again, perfect love casts out fear. Now, what does that mean? Do I, do I have to love as, as perfectly as I can that fear will be driven out? No, because we can't do that. We can't love perfectly. It's the love of the perfect God coming into our lives and our focus upon what He has done and how that love has come about that will drive out the fear. What's it simply saying? Go back to truth. Go back to the Word of God. I remember chatting some time ago to two people in particular who were involved in Christian things, and, and as far as I know, they still are. And we're chatting about just reading the Bible, imbibing the truth. And they roughly said the same thing, and they weren't together, by the way. I was quite astounded when they said, we probably may read the Bible about once a month. If we are to know about this God, and if we are to find out about the perfect love, that we can cast that back to God in a way of worship, then that will drive out the fear. Then we need to be in this book. We need to be in the truth. I'm going to finish by giving you, it sounds like seven points. It is seven points, but I'm going to rattle through them in, in seconds. Uh, a brilliant wee book came through our door one day about three weeks ago, Living, living Up to Downcast. Sorry. Lifting Up the Downcast by a guy called Patrick Sukdale. And I didn't order it. It came because I support an organization and the derived. Didn't even know it was there. But in, in uh, chapter 2, he writes about fear. And at the end of that chapter, he gives seven very simple points. We may open them out further in the future about how we can face fear. Here's the first one. I'm, I'm paraphrasing and shortening. One, Discipline our minds by filling them, or to fill them, with the Word of God. Just what we've said. Secondly, deliberately put your trust in God. Deliberately put your trust in God. And all the promises that are there. Thirdly, acknowledge that God is in control of our lives. And that nothing happens by accident. Acknowledge that God is in control of our lives. I was sharing this with somebody in the context of fear a few weeks ago. And I said, whatever stands in the middle of a bookshelf and all the books and all the chapters and all the paragraphs and all the words, at each end, if that bookshelf is our, my life or your life, at each end of that bookshelf is the sovereign God. And he works right through it. Acknowledge that God is in control of our lives. Fourthly, remember that God loves us and cares for us. Fifthly, embrace the divine will. Thank the Lord that He is there. Thank the Lord that He's in control. Sixthly, know the end. Know the end. Read the story. Know the end. And seventh was a bit, to me, unusual, but it's perfectly fitting. Care for others. Tell them these things. 
That's why local churches work, isn't it, when we do? We come together, we encourage each other, and we share with each other the things from God's Word to build each other up because we all face the same things. Let's pray. Lord, we ask your blessing upon fearful people watching or listening here today. You are the one whose perfect love casts out fear, drives out fear. And yet, Lord, we acknowledge that, and we know from your teaching, in this life we shall have many battles. But in this life as Christians, we have you, the one who is the living God, above all other man-made gods, above the evil one, is our living God. May your blessing be upon us now in Jesus' name, the blessing of your word for his glory. Amen. If you find yourself in a fearful place, don't be afraid to, to chat to Bertie or myself or to Billy and, and, or another Christian, and, and we'll try and help you as we can. We're going to close with a, a lovely song. It's the one we finished with last week. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. Just again, keeping our seats. Uh, I will go to the door, but stand a wee bit back. We just wait uh, for that after we have a, a short benediction. Before we read a few scriptures, let me say that uh, as things change as we go out of lockdown, we need to be aware of what's happening. So keep an eye on your email uh, that may come out from Bertie at any time as we hear of different things and as we open up. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 9, resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen.